Praise God. Good evening, everybody. Pastor Carter here. Uh, once again, looking forward to meeting with you tonight as we look at lesson number 11 of our course, Old Testament Bible Books of History, Part 1. Just one more lesson to go, ladies and gentlemen, and we will have completed another course. And um, to some of you who are just coming on, the uh, conference call people said that due to the uh, coronavirus and the fact that many people have canceled regular meetings, that there's an overload on their system and other systems of people who have chosen to do meetings via conference call. So if you all have experienced delay or you couldn't get on or um, can't stay on, that's the reason why. But we're going why? But we're going to go on, and we're recording now, and we greet everybody. Ryan, I see Ryan's up. If I can hear your voice, Ryan, I know we can, we're good to go. Go, Pastor Lisa. Praise God, Pastor uh, Lisa. Good to see you. Ryan uh, Trussler. We... Ryan, come on, say hello to us. Hey, Dr. Carter. How you doing? Hey, man, fine. How you doing? Oh, I'm just trying to get through the week, my friend. Okay, okay, it's a tough week for Ryan and his family, ladies and gentlemen, so pray much for Ryan and Tara. Tara's father passed away, and it's a rough week on them, but we we love you. We're praying much for you guys, Ryan, okay? Yeah, we, you know, we thank you personally uh, for the kind words and, and the prayers and the comments. Yes, and yes, and yes. And everybody. Praise God. You're not alone. You're not all by yourself. Your church family standing with you. And uh, give our love to Tara. And uh, we continue to trust the Lord for you guys. Okay. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We bless you and honor you. And we praise you. We rejoice in the God of our salvation. Father God, we thank you that we can come together again. And um, that we can study together online. And we ask that you would bless us and guide us as we study together tonight. We thank you for each and every one. ask that you bless each person and their families. And we ask a special blessing for Ryan and Tara and their families that go through this time of grief. Now, Father, we give you the glory and honor. We lift up this nation and the nations and the many people who have been plagued by this virus. Lord, you're bigger than any virus. Nothing can stop you. You're bigger than anything that comes down the pike. And so we put our trust in you. And so we ask that you bless each and every one. Continue to guide us and keep us. And we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So we are recording. We've got a lot of people online with us tonight. And um, we're looking tonight at Lesson 11 of our course. The course is entitled... Old Testament Books of History, Part 1. Old Testament Books of History, Part 1. We will be finishing up this course next week, ladies and gentlemen, and then you get a break from next week until the first week in May. And I know you're looking forward to getting a break, and, and I'm looking forward to getting a break, but you're doing so well, and the school is growing. We're coming along. We've got a whole lot of students and looking for more to come on board. So we give thanks to God for developing this great and powerful back-to-basic school of ministry where we have people studying for the associate degree, the bachelor's degree, the master's degree, and the doctorate degree. So I want to give a shout-out to God and to encourage you all to keep on keeping on and keep on trusting in the Lord. Tonight we're looking at First Kings. I'm sorry, 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapters 1 through 13. Tonight we're looking at 2 Kings chapters 1 through 13. And um like to just give you a little overview of this. We're going to look at the introduction. The, the, our introduction will come from my book, Understanding the Bible, Revised Edition. This is the book that I wrote last year. Some of you have copies of this. It's Understanding the Bible, Revised Edition. And we're ta we take a look at uh, 
what we said in this book about Second Kings. Actually, this is about First and Second Kings. Uh, Second Kings is the book of the captives. In Second Kings 17, the ten northern tribes went into captivity into Assyria. The people never returned from this captivity. In Second Kings 25, chapter 25, the southern kingdom of Judah went into captivity to the Babylonians under King Nebuchadnezzar. The temple was burned and destroyed. The walls and the city of Jerusalem were destroyed. Thousands were killed and captured, while only a remnant of the Jews remained 70 years later. Yes, we're recording. Hold on, just technical changes. We're recording. Okay. Um, Brian, am I coming in clear to you? Yes, sir. My voice is not jumping. Is it clear? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Okay. All right. Okay. Mm hmm. Okay. Might be your headset, Jackie. Okay. Um, there are scholars who say that the writer of Second Kings and First and Second Kings, one book, was an unknown prophet. Or others say that the writer of this book was a Jewish captive in Babylon at around 550 B.C. Josephus, who is the recognized historian of the Jews, ascribed the writing of Kings to the prophets. Others say that the prophets Ahijah, Ido, Shemaiah, and Jehu should be considered as the authors. And the most probable position is that the prophet Jeremiah is the author of First and Second Kings. So there's a lot of leaning toward the prophet Jeremiah as being the author of First and Second Kings. Early Jewish tradition um, of the Talmud says that Jeremiah wrote First and Second Kings. Well, whoever the writer is, this book tells us about the the, the rise of the kingdom and the downfalling of the kingdom, both kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel in the north. And when we say Israel, we're saying the ten tribes in the north that remained under the leadership of Jeroboam after the death of Solomon. The ten tribes were organized by Jeroboam. Jeroboam built two golden calves uh, and um Caused the people to rebel against God and to worship uh, two golden calves. And then the southern kingdom of the Jews were called Judah. This was Judah, the nation of Judah. And this uh, southern kingdom consisted of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, a small number compared to the ones in Israel. And when you look at the history of the Jewish people, the two kingdoms were both basically, basically corrupt, basically very uh, corrupt, and um, they were they were so corrupt that uh, very few of the southern kingdom kings were called good kings, and none of the northern kingdom kings were called good kings. I think the northern kingdom had. Uh, 19 kings, all of them are bad. The southern kingdom had 20 kings. About four or five were considered good kings. Okay. So we're looking at a period of 300 years of the king, the kingdoms, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. After the death of Solomon, the division of the kingdom into two kingdoms, then we're looking at a 300-year span of history, um, and much of that span of history consisted of the people rebelling against God, rebelling against God. I said over and over again in our Bible studies that we can 
learn a lesson, ladies and gentlemen, here in America and in other nations. We can learn a lesson by looking at the history of the Jewish people and their relationship with God and um, how God, ladies and gentlemen, God cannot forget sin unless it's covered by the blood of Jesus. God remembers rebellion. He remembers self-righteousness. He remembers uh, uh, pride and everything we have ever done, whether we've done it as an individual, as a family, uh, in a marriage, or as a church, or as a nation, everything we've done, we've got to give an account for, and we cannot cover. There's no way to cover sin and, and, and cause God to blink an eye. And there are a lot of people who think God will blink an eye at the things that they do. But God has a good memory. He has a good memory. And we need to learn from our study of um, the, the, the Old Testament. Okay, so we're looking at the divided kingdom in um, the books of First and Second Kings. Let's go to ch chapter 1, and um, look, at, look at this chapter. Then Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. By the way, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, uh, Karen can tell you, and, 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 and uh, well, we all know that there is a lot of confusion when it comes to looking at these names and so I want to, let me just deal a little bit so that I can help you with this confusion about these names of these kings. Then we go down and look at the list of kings. Um, who were the kings of ancient Israel and Judah? How long did they rule? Which ones were good, bad, or downright evil? God ruled over Israel in the promised land from the time of Joshua to Samuel and his sons. Saul then becomes the first anointed human king when the people rejected the Lord's rule over them. Saul's reign ended when after being wounded in battle, he took his own life on Mount Gilboa. A short time later, God informed David to go to Hebron where he was anointed king over the tribe of Judah. At the same time that David was anointed king over the tribe of Judah, Abner, Saul's army commander, made Saul's son Ishbosheth the ruler over the rest of Israel. Ishbosheth reigned as king for only two years until he was murdered in his bed. So you got a lot of assassinations taking place in the book in the books of Kings, and you'll see uh, Chronicles is is uh, like a shadow of Kings. King David ruled over Judah for seven and a half years. Then he ruled over the United Kingdom for 33 years. So David's reign was 40 years. Then after Solomon, uh, the kingdom was split into two kingdoms. God had promised that he would not split the kingdom uh, during David's time or his son Solomon's time. But Solomon, we can see, uh, helped lead to the division of the kingdom. He had all those wives, hundreds of wives and concubines, and they worshipped all kinds of gods and uh, uh, idols, and, and, and it was uh, the spiritual state of Israel was a mess. So when you look at the kings of Israel, uh, a good starting date is 1050. I have a graphic up on my screen. Uh, some of you can't get this graphic. You're, probably, you're on your phone. But I sent that this information out to you via an email this afternoon. So look for an email that has the title, a uh, list of kings of Israel uh, and Judah. Look for that email and hold that email because we'll be using the same graphic when we study the book of Chronicles starting in May. So uh, Saul reigned from 1050 to 1010. 40 years, his rating, bad. Uh, David from 1010 to 970, and David was considered the best king of Israel. From um, 1010 to 1008, this is a bad, uh, not, not a good, good 
uh, date there. Um, so forget about Ishbosheth. He Ishbosheth was named, uh, yeah, yeah, 1010 to 1008. He was uh, set up by Abner to be the king of the northern kingdom while David was king of the southern kingdom. Solomon, 970 to 930, uh, for 40 years he was so so. He's given a rating of so so. The divided kingdom. In 930 BC to 909, roughly 21 years, Jeroboam the first was king. He was bad. This this whole list is to help you with these names because the names become confusing, especially when you look at tonight's lesson and next week's lesson. All these names of people. So. We know you cannot remember all these names, but when you can see them in a graphic, it helps you in your study. 930 to 909 B.C., Jeroboam first. He was bad. 909 to 908, Nadab. He was bad. 908 to 886, Baasha. He was bad. 886 to 885, Elah. He was bad. 885, Zimri. He was bad for the few weeks that he, he lived as king. 885 to 880, Tibni, he was bad. 885 to 874, Omri, extra bad. So you have a running counter at the same time, Tibni and Omri. They're both kings at the same time, uh, depending on who their followers were. Um, Tibni was bad. Uh, Omni was extra bad. Uh, 874 to 853, and I also want to thank uh, Pastor, Co-Pastor Lisa Johnson for this graphic. Thanks, Lisa. 874 to 853, Ahab, the worst king, the worst king. 853 to 852, Ahaziah, bad. 852 to 841, Joram, most bad mostly. 841 to 814, Jehu, bad mostly. 814 to 798, Jeho Ahaz, bad. So these were the kings of uh, Israel from 930 B.C. to 798 B.C., continuing. In 798 to 782, Jehoash, bad. 793 to 753, Jeroboam II, bad. 753, Zechariah, bad. 752, Shalom, Bad. 752 to 742, Menachem. Bad. 752 to 732, Pekah. Bad. 742 to 740, Pekahiah. Bad. 732 to 723, Hosea. Bad. And uh, this date, 723, is the date of the fall of the northern kingdom to the Assyrians. Some scholars use the date 721. I prefer to use the date 721 before Christ. 721 B.C. In the year 721 B.C., Samaria, or the northern kingdom of the ten tribes of Israel, named Samaria or Israel, fell to the Assyrian king Shalmaneser V. And the Israelites went into captivity in Assyria. Ladies and gentlemen, please note that the Jews who went into captivity in the first captivity in 721 B.C. or 723 B.C., whatever date you choose to follow, they never came back to Israel, never came back to Samaria. They were carried off into Assyria, and they never came back. Their descendants did not come back. You, you may say, well, who populated Samaria and Israel during that time? Well, the Syrians sent their own people. They sent people to Samaria. And then you have different tribes living there. So that by the time that, um, by the time that uh, of, 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 of Nehemiah, when Nehemiah comes back uh, from Bab the Bab Babylonian captive, captivity, he runs against a lot of the Samaritans who are a mixed race of people who hate the Jews and they've come out of different countries uh, having been sent there by the, the Assyrians to populate what used to be the northern kingdom of Israel. 
After the death of Zimri in 885 B.C., Tiphany ruled half the nation and Omni ruled the other half. So the nation was split in 885 B.C. Except for this brief mention in Scripture, nothing else is known about Tiphany. After Tiphany's death, Omri became sole king of the northern kingdom. And then we have Pekah beginning in 752, and the, the, um, the reign of uh, these families ended in 7, uh, 732, or um, with Hosea becoming the king. And Hosea was the king at the time of the fall of Babylon. At the, I'm sorry, at the fall of the northern kingdom um, to the Assyrians. Now we're going to take a look at the, at the kings of Judah in the southern kingdom. Uh, Jack asked me, are you all supposed to be seeing this? No, but I sent you a an email today with this graphic. So uh, you might want to check this email later on. Pull up your email. Save this email um, with this graphic. The graphic is called List of the Kings of Israel and Judah or the kings of Israel and Judah, because you're going to be referring to this list when we study Chronicles in the next semester, and even next week as we continue the study of Second Kings, the names become confusing. When you see so-and-so assassinated so-and-so, and this person became king, well, you can refer to your chart and see these. So the kings of Judah, um, 930, B.C., right after the death of Solomon, Rehoboam became the king of Judah, the southern kingdom. He was mostly bad. By the way, if you don't have a copy of this email and you'd like one, please send me an email and I will send you. If you're listening to the recording and you don't have a copy of this graphic or this chart, send me an email and I will send you a copy of this tomorrow. Not tonight, tomorrow. Okay. After Rehoboam was Abijah. Uh, he was good. Okay, Rehoboam was bad. Rehoboam was bad. His big mistake was that he did not pay heed to the counsel of the old people. He gathered a lot of uh, millennials around him, and, and they figured they could run the government without the knowledge of the old people, and he messed up big time. 913 to 910, Abijah, he was good. 910 to 869, Asa. Asa was good. Ladies and gentlemen, Asa was a good king. I like Asa because Asa was bold. Asa's mother was called the queen mother of of Israel, and and she was corrupt. She had all these idols and sacrifices unto Baal and Asherah, and he removed her from the position of queen mother of Israel. He sent his mother down, and, and, and it took guts and courage to set your mama down, okay? He set his mama down, um, and she was no longer the queen mother of Israel because she led so many Israelis to, to worship idols. Okay, and Asa cleaned house. He cleaned house, ladies and gentlemen. He, he, he cleaned out Baal, Baal worshippers, Astro worshippers. He cleaned out the groves. I mean, Asa brought about reform. He was a good king. He was followed by his son, Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a good king. Very good king. Jehoshaphat, I like Jehoshaphat too because he woke up one morning and found that Israel was surrounded by a large army of people. And Jehoshaphat went to the, went to the temple, laid on the floor, and put on sackcloth and ashes and cried unto the Lord and said, We are surrounded. There is no way we can defeat this enemy that has surrounded our kingdom. What shall we do? And God spoke uh, through one of the prophets and, and told Jehoshaphat, don't worry, this is not your fight. Tomorrow you'll go up against this enemy, send the praise team out first, and send the Ark of the Covenant carried by the priest. You will not have to fight. The battle is not yours, God said. It is mine. And God gave Israel a great victory. Uh, when we say Israel, uh, there was no northern kingdom of Israel anymore. And, um, well, there was, a, a, there was a northern kingdom of Israel, but uh, we're looking at, 
at uh, Judah, the southern kingdom, under Asa Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was um, followed by Jehoram. Jehoram was bad. Ahaziah followed Jehoram. Ahaziah was bad. Queen Ahaziah. Joash was hidden. So Joash became the king, 835 uh, B.C. He was uh, good mostly. He was followed by Amaziah, his son, who was good mostly. Azariah, in 792, Azariah was king. Now, Azariah was uh, uh, the first cousin of uh, Isaiah. And Isaiah says in the, in the sixth chapter uh, of his book, in the year that uh, Uzziah, King Uzziah died. I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. So Azariah was Uzziah, and Uzziah was a good king. Continuing with the kings of the southern kingdom, Judah, we have Jotham in 750 to 735. Ahaz, and Jotham was good. Ahaz, 735 to 715 uh, B.C. Ahaz was wicked. Hezekiah, 715 to 686, one of the best kings of the southern kingdom, Hezekiah. And um, great story about Hezekiah. God sent Isaiah to see Hezekiah and to tell Hezekiah, get your house in order. You're going to die. Get your house in order. Hezekiah, ladies and gentlemen, according to the scriptures, turned his face to the wall, cried unto the Lord, prayed and cried, and God heard his cry. And before Isaiah had left the property of the palace, God spoke to Isaiah and said, go back to Hezekiah. I've heard his cry. Tell him I'm giving him 15 more years. What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah. So Hezekiah was followed by Manasseh, 696 to 642. Manasseh called the worst king of of the southern kingdom, the worst king. Manasseh was the Ahab of the south. Ammon uh, followed Manasseh. He was worse. He was worse, or one of the worst also, Josiah, 640 B.C. Josiah brought in reform in Israel, one of the best kings uh, of Judah. Je Jehoahaz, bad. Jehoiakim, now, it really gets confusing, Karen, when you look at the next to the last two uh, before we finish out this list. In 609, 598 B.C., you had uh, Jehoiakim as the king. He was wicked. Jehoiakim was followed by Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim and Jehoiakim. Kim and King. Kim and King. One was wicked and one was bad. And then the last king of the southern kingdom, Zedekiah. Zedekiah was bad, and the kingdom was taken away, and the people were carried away into Babylon. Okay, they were carried into Babylon. Jerusalem fell at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar captured Jehoiakim, put his eyes out, took him as a prisoner. Jehoiakim's sons became eunuchs. They were castrated, and then Zedekiah was set up as a puppet king over Judah, and Zedekiah had no authority of his own. He did whatever Nebuchadnezzar told him to do. And then in 586 B.C., King Nebuchadnezzar laid hold on Jerusalem for a third time. He destroyed the city, he burned the temple, and... That completed the destruction of, of the Jewish kingdom and Israel's control of the promised land. Israel lost control of the promised land um, at that time. But fortunately, when you look at 
um, later on in, in Chronicles, <clears throat> and you look at the book of uh, Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, because Jeremiah, because Jeremiah purchased some property and exercised his right to redeem the land. Jeremiah purchased the deed to the property, and it was because of Jeremiah's purchase when when the captives were brought out of Babylon. Um, Seventy years later, Ezra was able to see the witness, the documentation, and and the genealogical records of the people who were ho who were landowners, and and this is how the land was redistributed once the Jews were brought out of captivity. So due to the purchase of Jeremiah of the land and the records kept um, by many of the Jews even during the captivity and the genealogical records, they were able to put together a new Israel and that um, the, the, the Israeli people had their land, but they did not, not have control. You'll see that from roughly... Uh, mid mid five uh, 500s BC that uh, the Persians came and ruled them the Greeks ruled them the Romans ruled them and by 70 AD 70 AD uh, roughly 30 some years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ Jerusalem fell Jerusalem was destroyed and the Jews were scattered into the various nations of the world, and the Jews remained residents of various nations in the world until 1948, ladies and gentlemen. I was six years old. I was six years old when the Exodus took place, the Exodus, um, the second Exodus, where people left different nations and to return to Israel. Because the United Nations declared Israel to be a nation state. And in 1948-1949, you had an exodus of people, Jewish people from various nations of the world, <clears throat> coming back to Israel to set up their nation. And we see since 1948, the Jewish nation growing and thriving in the Mideast. The Jewish nation, the most powerful nation in the the Middle East, and in my estimation, the most powerful nation in the world. How can you say that, Pastor Carter, the most powerful nation in the world? Well, because the Bible says, blessed uh, uh, is that nation uh, who, 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 uh, who, who befriends Israel, okay? Uh, blessed is that nation whose God is the Lord. Blessed is that nation whose God is the Lord. And so Israel is blessed under great blessings, and um, even though Israel has been attacked over and over and over again by uh, different countries and co or coalitions of countries. God continues to defend Israel, and 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 God is going to deliver Israel. Uh, even after the rapture comes, Israel will remain a nation, and God will reveal himself to the Israelite people, and they will realize, they will realize uh that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the Mashiach. He is the Messiah. And and the, and many Jews will be saved. And then, uh, and then um, they'll be caught up with 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 the believers. The believers will be with Christ in 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 in, in heaven. And then God uh, will fulfill what John said. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And I saw the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven like a bride adorned for her bridegroom. This is a fascinating, wonderful history, ladies and gentlemen, a wonderful history. You'll say, well, where is the United States in this scheme of things? The United States is not in the scheme of things, ladies and gentlemen. The American people, as well as the people in any nation, in every nation of the world, we become a part of the new Israel when we receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. When, when people are saved, when people confess Jesus as Savior and Lord, I mean, when they genuinely get born again, get saved, they're born into the, the kingdom of God. 
and uh, being being uh, recipients of the new birth, the second birth, uh, we also become um, members of the household of faith or residents of the kingdom of God and Abraham's blessings. The same blessings God gave to Abraham become the blessings of the church. So uh, God is faithful. God is faithful. The Jews denied Jesus Christ, and 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 many to this day still refuse Him as Savior and Lord. But God has not forgotten His promise to them. And with the denial of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, God uh, chose the Apostle Paul, and 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 used Peter and others to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And so, with the denial of Jesus as Messiah. By the Jews, the gospel, the message, the promises of God were opened up to the Gentile nations. That's how you and I, ladies and gentlemen, uh, were able or able to come into the kingdom of God and to become recipients of the blessings of Abraham. So I know I did much of what I said uh, is not in your your textbook or on your in front of you. So refer to the chart that I send to you, the email that I send to you, and work with that, and um, you might want to look at it while you're replaying, while you're playing this this video, okay? So, um, okay. All right, I've said a whole lot right now, so is there anybody who has any questions at this particular time? Anybody who is thoroughly confused and you have a question? Dr. Jean Bratton, you have any questions? Any comments? Brian, can you still hear me? Brian Whitaker? Yes, sir. Okay, okay, fine. Okay, good. Then let's take a look at, this is going to be a, a brief look at uh 1 through 13. Moab, chapter 1 of 2 Kings, Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And Ahaziah fell down through a lattice in his upper chamber that was in Samaria and was sick. And he sent messengers and said unto them, Go, inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, Ekron whether I shall recover of this disease. Uh, no, no, boo. He sent for the wrong. He sent to inquire of the wrong God, Ahaziah, wicked king Ahaziah, fell through the ceiling of his upper chamber. And he said, go inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, whether I shall recover of this disease. Verse 3, but the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, arise, go up to, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say unto them, is it not because there is not a God in Israel that you go to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord, thou shalt not come down from that bed on which thou art gone up, but shalt surely die. And Elijah departed. Ladies and gentlemen, Elijah was a bad man. Whenever Elijah came around, people trembled. People trembled. So Elijah met the uh, the messengers of, of, of Ahaziah, and the message for Ahaziah was, no, you're not going to recover this. Isn't there, isn't there not a God uh, in Israel? And you're, requiring a, you're inquiring of Beelzebub? Ladies and gentlemen, it kind of grieves me that with this coronavirus pandemic that people are searching for all kinds of answers and hardly anybody's calling on the name of the Lord. And I preached on Sunday. You might want to get that powerful message. The recording is entitled, uh, The Cure for the Coronavirus Pandemic, as God gave us a cure. And, and ladies and gentlemen, no matter what comes down the pike, when we call upon the name of the Lord, God is faithful. God said, call unto me and I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things that you know not. That's Jeremiah 33.3. 3. And so God has the answer. 
But we're looking at a nation today. They're running around in confusion, trying to do this, trying to do that. Uh, uh, now they're trying to blame China for the coronavirus, and China's trying to blame North Korea, and then uh, North Korea and China both trying to blame America. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a mess when people just say, whoa, I'm going to trust in the Lord. Whoa, I'm going to trust in the Lord. I mean, the shelves are out of toilet paper, and uh, you can't get hand cleaners. Now people are, ladies and gentlemen, it gets pathetic. It gets downright pathetic. I saw a, a friend of mine on, on a, she created a video how to make your own hand sanitizer. Look, ladies and gentlemen, whatever happened to a bar of soap? Whatever happened to rubbing alcohol on your hands? Whatever happened to, ever happened to washing up? Karen, you have the answer to that. You're a nurse. Jean Breton, you have the answer to to that, you're a nurse. Call upon the name of the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Call upon him. And the number of people in this nation and the nations who, who refuse, uh, who want to be politically correct, they would try everything and anything to cure this coronavirus. Ladies and gentlemen, the coronavirus is only a, 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 the tip of the iceberg when you look at what's coming down the pike. Until people repent, ladies and gentlemen, and call upon the name of the Lord and get saved and worship him and worship God. We see this in First and Second Kings. We see this in First and Second Chronicles. When a nation turns its back on the Lord and kicks God out, when churches kick God out, when the government kicks God out and depend on their own resources, their own abilities, ladies and gentlemen, it is nothing short of courting disaster. Disaster has to come. There is no way you can win without Jesus. And so I encourage you, I encourage you, each and every one of you, as I encourage myself, trust in the Lord with all your heart and tell others, well, they might not like me, Pastor Carter. Hey, look, I don't care if they don't like me or not. I'm going to tell it like it is. I'm going to tell them the answer is in Jesus Christ. And you could try this, you could try that, you could try that, you could try that. The answer is in Jesus Christ. So uh, I hope you'll go and, and, uh, and, and download uh, my message from Sunday, uh, The Cure for the Coronavirus epidemic, uh, Pandemic. The Cure for the Coronavirus Pandemic. It will bless you. And so we have Elijah. And uh, Elijah is, is, has sent the word out to uh, Ahaziah, you're going to die uh, because you did not call on the Lord. And um, so they've got soldiers out looking for uh, Elijah. Ahaziah sends out squads of 50 soldiers with a captain over the 50. And the first captain of the 50 came upon Elijah and Elijah called down the fire from heaven to burn them up, and they all burn up. And then so Ahaziah did, did it again. He sent out 50 more with their captain to find Elijah. In other words, he wanted to bring Elijah to him, to Elijah could lay hands on him and, and heal him. And the second 50 got burned up because Elijah called down fire from heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, this was a man of God who can call down fire power from heaven. He had such a relationship with the Lord. Whatever Elijah spoke, God would do it. That's power. That's trust in the Lord. And so the third time that Ahaziah sent out a, a group of 50 soldiers and their captain, the, this captain has some sense. He has some sense. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of people need to read the Bible and get some sense. This man has some sense. He said, whoa, wait a minute, Elijah. Wait a minute. Before you call down fire from heaven, ho, let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. Don't burn us up. I'm, we're just under orders. And so Elijah asked God to blind them, blind them, fix it so that they could not see. And then Elijah led them. He led them into the Israeli, Israeli camp. And, and the captain of the Israel, Israeli army said, shall we kill them, put them to death? And Elijah said, no, we're going to show them mercy. Show them mercy. Feed them and, and, uh, uh, and send them home. And so Elijah asked God, take the blindness off them. Then the, they fed those soldiers and sent them home. And by the time they got home, 
uh, the enemy, Mo, the Moab said, hey, uh, look, look, God's on these people's side. We will not mess with them anymore. So evidently, Ahaziah died, and uh, they, the Moabs left the Jews alone. So this book is so powerful, so very powerful. Tonight we're looking at Elijah chapter 1, Elijah and Elisha chapter 2. And then Elijah is taken up in chapter 2, chapter 3, and we're not going to spend much time with chapter 2. Uh, Elijah chose Elisha because God told him, had told him when Elijah was hiding out in a cave that it's time for you to uh, anoint someone to uh, follow up in your work. And uh, so God has sent Elijah to anoint two kings and anoint Elisha to be the follower, the uh, one who would carry on the work of Elijah. Then Elijah, in chapter 2, is taken up in a golden chariot, a fiery, not a golden, a fiery chariot. And all the prophets in around Jordan and around the surrounding areas knew that God had spoken that it was time for Elijah to be caught up. So Elijah, Elijah did not die, ladies and gentlemen. Elijah was the prophet who did not die. He just rode, rode into heaven in a fiery chariot. And there was one other person in, in the scripture who did not die. And he just walked with God. That was Enoch. Enoch did not die. He walked with God. And so some people say, well, uh, when... Uh, before Jesus comes back again, he's going to send these two prophets back to earth, Enoch and Elijah, the ones who did not die, and they will be put to death uh, in Jerusalem. Okay, uh, chapter 3 of Second Kings, Jehoram reigns in Israel, and then um, Elisha's prediction of Moab is defeated. Chapter 4, the widow's oil. Chapter 4 is very interesting. The, a widow and her son, who um, she ran out of oil, and she was poor. She didn't know how she was going to survive, but Elisha told her, go and gather all the pots that you can and take that little bit of oil you have uh, and, 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 and fill each pot uh, with, with uh just pour, just start pouring oil. And she poured enough oil to fill all the pots she borrowed from her neighbors, and then she was able to sell those pots of oil, and that's how her, she and her son lived. Then you see the Shunammite woman, okay? The Shunammite woman, a very uh, faithful woman of God who every day she saw her, uh, she and her husband saw the man of God periodically, not every day, she saw the man of God come by, and so she asked her husband, she said, can we build a room on our house for this man of God so he can have a place to stay, he can get some food when he's journeying back and forth in, throughout this area? And, and the husband agreed, and so they built a house, they built a room for Elisha and his servant Gehazi. Uh, Gehazi. And um, at one point, the woman, well, well. at one point, Elijah says, God wants to bless you. And how can God bless you? And Gehazi said, well, she's without child. She doesn't have a son. And so her husband was old, old as dirt. But God did with this husband and wife the same thing he did with Abraham and Sarah and opened her womb. And she had a baby the next year. And... um then later on, a few years later, the child was in the field with his father, and the child said, my head, my head. And uh, he might have had a sunstroke or a stroke, and they laid him up. Uh, Elijah carried, the woman carried the baby up uh, and, and to her house. She sat with him on her, he sat on her knee for several hours, and he died. And she carried the child up into Elijah's room. And then she told her servant, saddle me my donkey. And she went to find the man of God. This is a powerful story, ladies and gentlemen. The Shunammite woman. Elisha sees her coming, riding his way. And he says to Gehazi, isn't that the Shunammite woman? 
And uh, uh, Gehazi said, yes. Uh, Elijah says, well, Elisha says, well, go find out what the problem is. So Gehazi runs up to the woman, is it well? She says, it is well. I mean, she's operating in faith, ladies and gentlemen. Her son died, and she wants to find the man of God. So the servant of the Lord said, is it well with thee and with your family? She said, it is well. And then she told Elisha how her child died, and Elisha uh, uh, rode uh, along with Gehazi and the woman back to her house, and then Elisha found the child and uh, stretched himself out over this child, mouth on the child's mouth, eyes on the child's eyes, hands on the child's eyes, so must have been a pretty big boy by then, and called upon the name of the Lord, and God restored life. God brought life back into this child. And it's a powerful story. That's in chapter 4. Chapter 5, we see another great miracle. Naaman, Naaman was a great man. Oh, he was a great warrior. He was a Syrian, a great general. The scripture says, but he was a leper. But he was a leper. Chapter 5 of Second Kings. Now Naaman, captain of the hosts of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. He was a leper, ladies and gentlemen, which means he was not really to socialize with other people. And uh, Naaman had brought back from one of his raids into Israel a a, an Israelite maiden, and she became the handmaiden for Naaman's wife. And so at one point in a conversation, uh, the, the young maiden said to Naaman's wife, uh, did you know there's a prophet in Israel? He can cure your husband. And so the, the, the woman talked to her husband, and, and so Naaman got uh, uh, the, the uh, permission from the king of Syria to go to find this prophet named Elisha. And when he came to Elisha uh, with, with his army and a lot of gold and silver and all this, and uh, Naaman expected Elisha the prophet to <clears throat> come out and wave a magic wand or lay hands on him. And Elisha, Elisha didn't even come out of his house. He sent Gehazi and said, uh, go and dip in the Jordan River seven times. Take seven baths in the Jordan. And Naaman got an attitude, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, he he got puffed up like a lot of people in the church get puffed up when you try to give them the word of God when they're bent on sinning and doing their own thing and they don't want any correction. You know who I'm talking about. Some of you know people like this. And Naaman almost lost his blessing because of his own proud attitude. He said, are not the rivers in Syria, just as good as the uh, 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 Jordan River. Why should I have to bathe in the Jordan River? I mean, he almost grumbled and complained and missed his, almost missed his blessing. And then Gehazi, the prop, prophet's servant, said, Now, my master, if the man of God had told you to do some great feat, some, some uh, uh, real manly thing, you would have done it. But all he said was take a bath seven times in the Jordan. And you'll be healed. Now, now, do you want to be healed? And that's a that's a good message. That's a good message uh, for you preachers out there, you teachers. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be delivered? Do you want God to heal you? And so uh, Naaman dipped in the Jordan, and his leprosy disappeared. And 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 uh, Naaman rode off. He promised. He asked Elisha if he could give him gifts. Elisha said no. But Gehazi, listen to this, ladies and gentlemen, and this is a good example of greed in the body of Christ, greed in the church. The servant ran after uh, Naaman and said, well, my master said, we've got two young uh, uh, students in the school of ministry, and they need chains of cl uh, clothing. Can you send me two chains of clothing for them and, and, and ten talents of gold and, and uh, Naaman uh, did that and Gehazi took their clothing and the money and hid it in his, in, his, in his room but listen to what Elisha said Elisha said why did you deceive 
uh, me and why did you why did you uh, deceive God? He said, what What do you mean? What do you mean? He said, uh, God told us not to take anything from Naaman. Why did you take the money and the clothing? You see, God will reveal things about you and about me to other people. And so that's why we need to be careful how we treat other people. God showed it to the prophet. And, and, and then the prophet proclaimed to Gehazi the same uh, leprosy that was on Naaman will be now on you and your posterity, your future generations. And so this uh, Second Kings is full of amazing uh, messages and teachings. Uh, chapter 6, the Syrian army was struck blind. Uh, chapter 7, all about the Syrian army was routed. Uh, uh, they, it was a very powerful army. Israel didn't even have to fight. God routed the army. And then in that chapter, seventh chapter, we see a, a group of lepers get rich. I mean, the poor, the downtrodden, the despised, the outcasts, they got rich. And, and, and they got so rich by just uh, picking uh, the spoils from the dead Syrian army that uh, they realized, hey, whoa, 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 whoa. There is too much here for us. We can't handle all these riches. Let's tell our brothers and sisters about this, this this discovery. And so they went and told the Israelites, and the Israelites came and, and, and got the riches. Okay, so chapter 8, Jehoram became, becomes king in Judah. So what, do you ha what we have in this uh, lesson, ladies and gentlemen, we see... The kings in Israel, the northern kingdom, and uh, uh, correspondingly we see the kings of the southern kingdom. So it is confusing when you look at First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles because uh, the script will flip from uh, the northern kingdom to the southern kingdom, or from the southern kingdom to the northern kingdom. We see in chapter nine of, first, of Second Kings. Jehu is anointed. Jehu was the son of uh, Ahab. Then Jezebel is eaten by the dogs. The dogs ate her, just as Elijah had prophesied. Chapter 10, Jehu, the newly anointed king of the northern kingdom, the son of Ahab, gathers the people, and he outlawed Baal worship. In other words, Jehu destroyed Hundreds of Baal priests. Chapter 11, we see Jehoiada's plan and then jo Joash, Jehoash made king. Refer to your chart in the email that I sent to you. Chapter 12, the temple is repaired. And then chapter 13, we see um, Jehoahaz is king of Israel. And then the death of Elisha. So a lot of things go on. A lot of things go on. Let's look at the death of Elisha. Do not confuse Elijah and Elisha. Elijah uh, was the father of, of, of these prophets. He, uh, and, and he anointed Elijah, Elisha to follow after him. Elisha had a double anointing of the anointing that Elijah had. Listen to this um, when Verse 20, and Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass, as they were burying a man, that, behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived. And stood up on his feet. Woo, ladies and gentlemen, the Moabs, Moabites had come into Israel, the northern kingdom, to fight against the Israelites. And uh, when they saw some their the enemy soldiers, they they were about to they were trying to bury one of their uh, dead soldiers, a companion. And then in during the funeral. Uh, 
procedure, they spotted a band of Israelite soldiers. And so they did a quickie funeral. Funeral. It was a quickie, ladies and gentlemen. They, it was so quick, they threw the man into the tomb of Elisha. And then they went lickety-split trying to get, get away from the Israelite army. And the Bible tells us in the 21st verse of chapter 13, 2 Kings, and when the man was let down, and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Ladies and gentlemen, the dead man came back to life when his body touched the dead bones of Elisha. There was still life in the bones of Elisha. Holy Ghost power, ladies and gentlemen. We're talking about revival. We need, we need, we need, ladies and gentlemen, we need a lot of these dead bones in America to touch the bones, uh, 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 touch the Holy, Holy Spirit-filled bones. Uh, we need, what we need in America, ladies and gentlemen, is what uh, Ezekiel saw in the Valley of Dry Bones. God said, can these bones live? Because we've got all over America and all over the nation, we've got religious people, religious people, but they're all dry bones. Many refuse to acknowledge the Holy Ghost. Many refuse to submit to the Lord. But if, if the church will touch the Spirit of God and get filled with the Holy Ghost, if this nation, if the president, if the leaders will call upon the name of the Lord, I mean, let's go beyond what the president proclaimed last week as he proclaimed Sunday as a day of prayer. I don't hear anything more about oh, uh, have, uh, after they proclaimed Sunday as a day of prayer. He asked the people to pray, which was good, which was good, which was good. But ladies and gentlemen, we need a revival. We need a Holy Ghost revival in America and the nations. A revival. If God said, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, I'll heal the land. Ladies and gentlemen, God will blow the coronavirus out of the air if his people will humble themselves and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways and pray. Then we'll be just like that dead soldier, that Moabite, who was thrown into the, the crypt, uh, the, the grave of, of Elisha, and we'll come alive. We'll come alive. Ladies and gentlemen, the church can come alive if we let the Lord revive us. The church has to realize, God, I'm dead. I can't do this on my own. I need your power. We can't legislate this uh, with the uh uh, House of Representatives or the Senate. We can't pull this thing off uh, with, with this department or with this, uh, this agency. We need you, Lord God. And when that happens, the dead Moabite soldier or the United States of America can come alive or the dead Moabite soldier, the nation of Canada or the nation of England or France or China or Korea will come alive when people call upon the name of the Lord. Well, that's as far as we can go with this tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I've had a good time, and um, I hope you have. And um, we're near the end of the course. We've looked at half of Second Kings. We'll look at the other half next week, and it will be even as exciting you got a whole lot of names to look at in next week's lesson, but we'll work through those names and we'll work through what God has for us. In the meantime, continue to trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean into your own understanding. Ladies and gentlemen, don't give in to the gloom and the doom that has gripped this nation. And, and, and don't try to politicize things. And and uh, if you have to, just turn the news off. Just turn it off, and 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 and, and uh, 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 turn on turn on a uh, uh, TBN. Listen to Jensen Franklin preach a little bit. 
I mean, that man's fired up. The guy from Gainesville, Georgia, uh, or, or or play some play play your tapes and, and and stay before the Lord. Continue reading the Word and fast and pray and give God the glory and honor. God's got the answer. God's gonna move, ladies and gentlemen. He's moving already. Praise God. He's God. He knows what to do. And 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 the church, we're not to worry. We're not to fret. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say unto the Lord, He's my refuge, my fortress, my strength, my God. In Him will I trust. You make the Lord your trust. And don't let anybody turn you around. You stay on the wall. You be like Nehemiah. Don't you let anybody steal your crown. Praise God. Father, we thank you and bless you and honor you and love you, Lord God. We love you. Thank you for our study tonight. Continue to bless your people, God, and bring people into the kingdom. Save daily such as should be saved. Lord, cause the nation, cause the nations to repent. Cause us all to repent. Father, let no sin dwell in us, God. We love you, worship you, honor you, praise you. Move by your spirit, Father. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, praise God. Praise God. We're going to end the recording, but uh, I want to say before we end the recording, please, if you feel uh, like you, you want to ask me a question or there's something I need to clear up or you have some comments, Get in touch with me. Give me send me an email, Leroy Carter sixty nine at Yahoo dot com or, or or ring me up on my cell phone, four oh four two oh five one one zero one or catch me at the website or on Facebook or on YouTube.